All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning. It's a little bit early for individuals on site. Um, today, we're talking on a workshop on connecting open code with policymakers to development. And an agenda that we have here today, we're going to go through a round of introductions and then overview of connecting open code with policymakers. Then we'll move directly to our panel discussion and then a QA. and a um, feel free to ask questions also to our online participants as well. I'm going to hand it over first to Mike Linksfair to do an introduction. Uh, one second, we might have slight technical difficulties and One moment while I fix that, I'm going to hand it over to Halani and, oh, never mind, we have Mike now. Hey, thanks a lot for resolving those technical difficulties. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I'm Mike Linksfair. I'm the VP of Developer Policy here at GitHub, a former developer myself who's now been doing uh, policy work focused on uh, making the world better for developers and helping developers make the world world a better place kind of open source is the the a big part of the way that happens and i'm really excited about measuring it um informing policymakers about what's going on and so i'm really excited about this panel great and i'll pass it over to our speakers here halani and Henri. is that a specific question or uh just to introduce yourself oh, right. Okay, I'm Helani Galpaya. I'm the CEO of Learn Asia. Uh, it's a think tank that work acro works across the Asia Pacific on broadly infrastructure regulation and policy challenges, but with a huge focus on digital policy. Thank you. Hello, good morning. I'm Henri Verdier, French ambassador for digital affairs. Just to mention that I'm not a career diplomat. I was a French entrepreneur a long time ago and I used to be the state uh, CIO for France. Great, thank you. So we're gonna move directly to our panel talk and to start, let's talk a little bit more about challenges from NMIT data needs. So let's start with Halani here. What are some of the challenges that you've seen over the years on unmet data needs? I mean, from a development perspective, um, understanding where we are in whatever those development objectives, that's the starting point of any kind of development, and that's a problem if there is no data. Um, the, and particularly when it comes to developing countries, which is where I come from, uh, this is a particular challenge, right? Um, so traditionally, we've relied on government-produced data sets. Um, take, for example, the census. Every 10 years, it's supposed to happen. And uh, low levels of digitization has traditionally meant it takes about three years after the census to actually get some data out in many countries, by which time you know the population has changed, the migration patterns have changed, and so on. Um, but we know now there are obviously lots of other proxy data sets that we can use. But you know the timeliness is one concept uh, that you know we really need we worry about in development because the data is slow to come by if, even when it is available. The second unmet need is if you're outside of government, is the availability of data to actors outside government. And frankly, within government, sometimes the data that's collected by one department or ministry is not even available to others, right? So there's a very low level of data access possible within government, and certainly for civil society and private sector outside government to access data. Uh, many governments have signed on to open data uh, charters and all of those things, but really the data um, that they put out is sometimes not what most people need. 
It's not usually in machine readable format, so you spend enormous amounts of time digitizing it and datafying it. Um, so these are sort of you know basic challenges, and and basically, I mean, from the government point of view, you know, governance and regulation in particular, the oxygen that feeds that engine is data, because there's a huge data asymmetry between the government and the regulators versus the governed entity, take telecom operators, for example, right? How are they doing? They have a lot more information about their operations than the regulators or the governed, governing party would. So there's really multiple data challenges uh, that we have. Uh, and, in private, and increasingly, the conversation is that the private data sector data can act as a proxy to inform development, but negotiating that and accessing that is particularly hard. So there's multiple data challenges in developing countries, particularly from our point of view as a research organization sitting outside government and outside private sector. Thank you for the question. Fifteen years ago, or something like this, government understood that open government data was very important. And together, we, we, we did work a lot to open our data, and then maybe we'll commit later our source code. And we, we learned some lessons that those data could create much more value if more people can use it that uh, it was a matter of transparency, democracy, but also economic development, efficiency, uh, and maybe citizenship. And more and more we understood that government don't have the monopoly of general interest, and some very important data will lie in the are in the private sector. So it's time probably, and that's uh, the, the moment, to, 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 to start thinking uh, deeply, even philosophically, uh, about the private sector data. In Europe, first there is a, a growing consensus that first we need to, to help research and to promote knowledge. There are a lot of topics where we have to know. <laughs> I can speak about uh, disinformation, uh, some, some impact of social networks, but also climate change or some important topics, we need more knowledge. And for example, if you look at the DSA that we did adopt last year, we do organize a specific access uh, to private data to, to for public research. Of course, I know that there are um, important issues, privacy, intellectual property, sometimes security, because uh, if you, share everything, you can organize, uh, you, you can allow uh, reverse engineering and hacking, etc. But we can fix it. And for example, there is a, an important field of research regarding confidential computing. You can use the data without taking the data. So this is a, a, a growing consensus and probably we will have collectively the, the international community to make the public research uh, stronger and to, to, to organize ourselves to be able to understand important mechanisms. Uh, but then there are also uh, other actors that need access to those data. Uh, and in, for France, for example, first we do encourage the private sector to be more responsible. Let's think, for example, about the transportation, transport industry. If you don't have all the data, you have nothing. If you don't have buses and taxis and personal cars and motorcycle and metro and a train, you don't understand the system and you cannot take good decision. And this is in the interest of everyone, the public decision maker, private actors, everyone needs a, a good comprehension, of the, a good knowledge of the system itself. So we do encourage uh, cooperation, sharing the data, etc. Then uh, we, we think that we can go further. Maybe you know the French uh, economy Nobel Prize, uh, Jean Tirole. He did publish a lot about uh, the economy as a common good. And we consider that it's time to, to conceive some incentive to, to make the private sector share some, what we, uh, so, some important data. And those, this year, uh, in the French government, we are starting to work uh, deeply on what we call data of general interest, the données d'intérêt général, because as I said, uh, government don't have the monopoly of general interest, and some data should be considered as too important to be allowed to remain private. 
of course, this is uh, complex because we need a, a legal framework to give a status to this kind of data. But really, we, we did open the, the case <laughs> to, to create a status for some very important, impactful data and to, to decide that those data has to be open, even if they come from the private sector. Perfect. I do also wonder, you mentioned um, one thing about policy and standards. Uh, a lot of metadata has very clear standards in financial markets, in healthcare, for instance. Um, I'm curious to know, are there any admin needs within the standards of metadata? Um, it's currently governed uh, quite well, but is there anything, is there a certain standard that isn't out there that could be? I mean, the data we deal with, my data scientists deal with um, telecom, mobile telecom network, big data, basically call detail records, for example, that we get from base stations, trillions of call detail records. Uh, these are not standardized under any means, right? Um, in fact, you know, the team spent, you know, four to six months cleaning up the data because across, when you get data from four to six telecom operators, uh, they're actually not standardized, the, how the numbers are, you know, so it, they're not interoperability standards. There are many, many sectors where there isn't interoperability standards. And of course, you know, some of the coolest stuff that comes out is um, from unstructured data anyway, right? Like social media data and so on, right? So, you know, I think, it, you know, the financial sector has traditionally been well forward in this. Uh, but many other sectors haven't. Health, I think, in developing countries is less developed, um, interoperability standards. Uh, and even, and certainly for cross-border data sharing, this is a fundamental problem, right? Like when you uh, look at taxation data, all of that, uh, there's a lot more work that needs to be done, I think, particularly when it comes to developing economies. Yes, uh, I did join the French government 10 years ago to lead the open data policy. Um, my l the lesson learned is that if you wait for a perfect standardization and a good metadata, you will never do anything. When I did join the French government, we wanted to index every data set through an index that was conceived during the Middle Age for the National Archives <laughs> with 10,000 words. <laughs> so it was quite impossible to publish a data set because you had to come back to Philippe Lebel to decide where you did. Uh, in the so I, I take from the open data movement the idea that share your raw data as they are and don't wait. But it doesn't mean that standards don't matter. Of course, they, they do. But let's start by publishing. The second lesson is that maybe the APEification AP process is more important than the indexation on metadata themselves. So first, during maybe five years, you did publish everything, but it was not always very useful, especially for data that has to be refreshed very frequently, and you need the last data and not just a data. <laughs> so for this, we did uh, then take three years to, to organize a, a proper um, API ec ecosystem. And again, people told me, then first you have to conceive a good architecture of the API system. I said, no, let's build APIs, and then we will optimize <laughs> the API system. So my lesson is that, um, and my personal experience, don't wait for a perfect <laughs> standardization because you will never accede to this goal. This is a, uh, this is a, a moving target, so don't wait. <laughs> Thank you. And I think that brings us to the, our next point quite well on, you highlighted, you both highlighted this as well on private sector data for development purposes. And I know Mike also has some thoughts on that. But I'd love to know, um, you mentioned on private sector data, a lot of times it's a little unstructured, but that's interesting because um, you have, it's wider. You can take a look and anal analyze that um, in, in an easier way. Tell us a little bit more on that. What has been a surprising find? On private sector data? Yes, you said, and some unstructured data. So I mean, unstructured data uh, that you know we work with include, uh, for let's say, for misinformation and disinformation identification, automatic identification of mis and disinformation uh, that spread across platforms in 
languages outside of English in particular. Um, and there, uh, I, I think, the, well, there's sort of two types of problems. One is just the lower levels of data. So, I mean, you know, even assuming you have all the language resources, like um, a language corpus that is needed to identify this on, you know, using nat natural language processing, you, at some point, you're going to need a fact base to check against, right? So, um, there, the unstructured data is, well, structured or unstructured data comes from government resources and maybe other sort of credible sources, right? So, you're dealing with two types of data uh, to fact check numbers, you're looking at usually trying to find government, and to fact check other things, you're looking at reports and so on. And there's a serious lack of data. So, for example, if you look at like the big popular English language, language models, they are trained on millions of articles. We tried this in Bangladesh and Sri Lanka to fact check. We are down to 3,000 articles that are credible, uh, you know, sort of data sources that we can use to fact check against unstructured, you know. So we, we are working with a very, very limited universe of credible data that's actually out there because there's very little out there. So I think that's for us the biggest challenge. Sorry. It's a very complex question. Uh, first, I was thinking that Completely unstructured data are very rare because usually someone did produce the data and did pay something. So, uh, a data set is, is the answer to one certain question, but usually it's not your question. <laughs> so, so, they have a structure, usually. Uh, of course, in the world of Internet of Things and uh, sensors, and, uh, you have more and more uh, quite not structured data, but if you do observe, we are living in a world of uh, data with purpose, so they, they have a structure. So the question, again, is to, to think about interoperability and to build bridges. Um, one other question with uh, unstructured data or l with a minimum structure is that if you want to share the data to give them the, as, many, as more value as they can have, you also have to protect other important uh, securities, like, again, privacy but not just privacy, uh, like uh, interoperability. Um, and if you don't really understand what is within the data, <laughs> you are not sure that you are protecting the, the, all the securities you have to protect. That's why I, I pay more and more attention to the field of research, as I said, of um, confidential computing. Uh, we have to learn to work with the data, to train AI model, to as question, for, for example, let's, uh, let's see, uh, in France, as you know, we have an ancient and very structured social security system. So there is one database, in the uh, social security, with every prescription that every French doctor made during the last 20 years. Can you imagine this? 70 million people, every prescription made by a doctor during 20 years. And then we make a statistic um, archive. So you take one percent, and we. Here, of course, you have a lot of uh, knowledge and science. You can discover new drugs, because you can discover that I don't know someone that did had a lot of head ash at the age of 20, don't have Alzheimer 40 years later, and you can discover an, a new principle of some drug and, uh, and lot of things like this. But you cannot just open this kind of data because this is pure privacy. This is my health and your health. And but you can organize a technical strategy to accede to those data without sharing them. And if you do this, you can control a bit the people that are using those data. And if they don't respect some laws or principles, you can disconnect them. So um, this is probably an important field. Um, so again, I'm not looking for a perfect standardization. But we can organize the ecosystem of uh, how to access to access to the data, when, <laughs> why, and uh, and give another uh, relation between uh, knowledge and data. 
And I mean, I agree with the minister. Some of the solutions are technical, like we've certainly worked with like differential privacy methods, you know, when we use call data records um, to sort of still have the data be as usable to inform policy, but without revealing, you know, where an individual might actually be or, you know, who the, what that person's number is and all of that, right? Uh, the other part of the solution, I think, is policy, is to have some kind of governing structure to make sure that, you know, we are able to use it and preserving the privacy and what that, and having some sort of rules around what that <coughs> user is, uh, what that data is used for, so like in the healthcare system, that insurance companies cannot use it and then drop you know, private insurance companies cannot drop coverage because they have so much more information about a set of users. Even if they're not individually identifiable, once you're in an insurance pool, you can identify that this is a much higher risk. So there's sort of, you know, policy as well as technical solutions there. I think on the privacy part, I'm very curious to also know from, hear from Mike, um, what are your thoughts on privacy and pub oh, sorry, private sector data. Um, love to know your thoughts on that too, or anything to add. Okay, yeah, well, I first would say that I, I should have said in my introduction and shouldn't assume people know what GitHub is where I work. It's the largest platform where software developers from around the world come to develop software collaboratively, um, a lot of it open source. And there are a lot of themes I'm hearing that you can, I mean, Software development is kind of a very specific thing, but I think there are a lot of themes we've talked about. Unstructured data, APIs, um, and privacy that maybe I can paint a little bit of a picture about how it works uh, with uh, data about code development and that the code that programmers are writing is data itself and indeed you could think of it as unstructured data, it's a text file, but it also each programming language has its own structure that because it needs to be able to parse the individual statements. So it's really a matter of how much, um, how much work do you wanna do and what are the questions that you have, um, uh, it, that you have about, for example, um, software development. Um, and then APIs is another aspect. You can, if you want to crawl all of the code, we call it repositories is where a, a particular project on, on GitHub or similar platforms are collaborated on. If you wanna crawl all of the code in the world, that will you know, take you a long time and be very resource intensive. However, GitHub and similar platforms also make APIs available. So I think that's another kind of common theme that we can look at how, how exactly that looks with code where you can both kind of do queries to ask questions about kinds of projects that you're interested in, or you can kind of try to ingest all of the activity as it comes out because um, GitHub has a very open kind of everything, all events feed, but that also is extremely expensive to do. Um, so as a, um, and some, re some researchers who do kind of research around programming trends, uh, I don't know, cybersecurity, there's a bunch of different kind of research areas that you can look at GitHub data to do. Um, uh, you know, a lot of them spend a lot of their time kind of gathering data before they can even uh, answer or, you know, kind of validate whether they're, they're asking the right questions. So one approach to that and dealing with privacy is, is publishing aggregate data that will be, you know, helpful for some use cases. And that's what we've done with a new kind of initiative we have at, at GitHub we're calling the Innovation Graph, which is, um, basically longitudinal data on a per a country, per economy, roughly country basis at various kinds of activity. And so that, and we did it particularly to inform, an, um, you know, policymakers and international development practitioners who want to understand, use that data to understand, you know, things like digital readiness within, within their sphere of 
of influence. And to we were able to publishing aggregate data kind of satis, satisfy some of these use cases or at least allow us people to explore the aggregate data to figure out what they want to make an investment in, you know, crawling more. It also served neatly deals with the fundamental privacy questions that you don't want to identify, you know, individuals and things like that. So you can do that by kind of, you know, thresholding a certain number of people have to be doing an activity within a country in order to report aggregate statistics on uh, on that. So you know, that, that covers a lot of different themes I think we've heard covered there. Um, and I think there's a ton of promise in you know, a range of technologies like confidential computing, differential privacy. And I'm excited about them all because developers are, are building them and a lot of the research slash the R&D is, is um is open source um but simple i guess i'll just highlight here that you know very simple approach but kind of very low tech approach of as a first you know step at sharing data can be just sharing aggregate data that doesn't have any privacy concerns can be you know that's it's actually very much kind of uh to Henri's point about like sharing data before you do all of the standards work because that will, you know, you might be waiting forever. Also, sharing aggregate data is a way to kind of take that first step, share data that's going to be useful to a range of stakeholders, and then, you know, work on the harder part uh, that might be, you know, pending more advanced technology to deal with um, uh, the harder issues. Oh yeah, please. A small answer. First, we 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 know we know and cherish uh, GitHub. When I was a state CIO, France was the second uh, public contributor, government contributor in GitHub. And I don't know if you know, but by French law, every software that the government develops has to be open source and free software. So open source and freely uh, reusable. And more than this, every time that uh, the government uses an algorithm to take a decision, he has to publish the source code, but also to tell to the citizens that he, we are using uh, algorithm and to be able to explain in a simple word how it works. So that's uh, an important and coherent policy. And regarding uh, the structure or unstructured data, uh, what I learned from... Um, my open data um, experience, uh, as I said, uh, the first duty is to share data as they are. And then some people will structure. And if we think again about GitHub, so as I said, we cherish GitHub, but we work a lot within GitHub. And then, for example, in France, I don't know if you know the Software Heritage Project. So here, some researchers from the INRIA decided to, to build the, the biggest possible archive of every software. So taking GitHub, but also some dead forges like uh, the Google One, or and they, they are build, uh, working hard to structure it now to to be able to to track the genesis of a, a soft. So they they are working, but we did allow this because we did publish unstructured software, and then some people can continue, and maybe someone will do better. I don't know, but we will have a variety of experiences. Uh, so my lesson is to to separate first publish and then structure, <laughs> and you can have a diversity of attempts to structure if you have a common ground of uh, raw data or software. I think you mentioned a really yeah, interesting. Just, oh, sorry, please, Mike. Oh yeah, I just wanted to add, add to that. I mean, thanks for cherishing GitHub. I definitely cherish uh, software heritage, and really the um, you know archiving is almost a third part that is also extremely important and I think uh, under invested in. So I think in the software preservation space, Software Heritage is doing an amazing job, but I think that's, um, you know, preservation of data is uh, something that can be decoupled from the making available and structure, but I think is extremely important to think about. 
Absolutely. I think um, we actually have a slide here as well on yes, the innovation graph that Mike had mentioned. And um, I also saw in the audience here, we have Mala Kumar, who um, helped on the standardized metric research because we wanted to understand exactly what type of data um, would help and what type of data would public sector or um, the social sector require. And as you mentioned, we have the API, which is that large set of data that Henri mentioned at first. And then now we gathered all the data sets into um, specific aggregated data that uh, based on economies, um, just in the pattern that Henri had mentioned. I'm not sure, Mike, if you want to mention anything on there. I think you also may be able to share your screen if you'd like. But also, huge thank you to Mal Kumar, who led that standardized research, uh, metrics research, who's joining us online. Yeah, I can share my screen briefly if it would be useful. I'm not sure what the, if folks will be able to see in the room. So maybe I'll share and uh, you can tell me whether you can actually see it in a useful way. Um, okay, can you see, see anything on the screen? Yes. Yes, okay, great. I, I think I'm sharing, uh, window that has the page for France and the innovation graph. So this is just to show that we have a bunch of data on a per economy on a per economy basis. Some of them are fairly technical. Uh, Git pushes is basically code uploads to, to GitHub and you can see that summer vacation actually happens. Um, and repositories, as I was saying, this is the kind of unit of a project on on GitHub and similar platforms have are using the same concept. Um, developers, those are people actually writing the code or in some cases doing design around software project. Um, organizations, which is kind of a larger unit of organizing projects on on GitHub that sometimes correspond to a real world organization, sometimes do not. Um, programming languages. Um, this can be very useful for thinking about skilling within a country. Um, and licenses are about copyright. Um, and then probably, oh, and then topics are, this is currently very unstructured. Um, basically, maintainers on GitHub can assign keywords to their projects. But this can also be, so it's in a very noisy data, but can be helpful in um, you know, really diving into like identifying a set of projects that you want to study more. And one thing that I'm excited about, and do, so you can tag with any kind of text. So even going forward, uh, people might tag that, you know, your project is relevant to a particular sustainable development goal. And so you'll be able to kind of navigate the tags in that way or the topics in that way. And finally, perhaps most interesting and new is this kind of kind of a trade flow diagram. You can see uh, economies that France is collaborating with that developers are kind of sending code back and forth. So you see US, Germany, uh, Great Britain, um, Switzerland. It's unsurprising that those are some of the top ones. You can also combine all the EU member states. And this is kind of a first release. There's obviously a lot of other exciting analysis that can be done. The data is actually open in um, in the repository and see the data here. And you know, at the end of the day, data can be extremely boring. This is literally a CSV file. And so, but that boringness is fantastic because it means that um, you know you can use your tool of choice, whether it's a spreadsheet, a Jupyter notebook, or or something fancier to to analyze the data. And then I'll just show really quick the the reports that that um, Cynthia and Mala mentioned worked on. And that kind of really drove our requirements for this project, looking at what kinds of data about software development would actually be useful for um, international development, public policy and economics practitioners. So did a lot of um, you know, discussions with entities that are part of the data development partnership, for example, um, to help design this. And then I also pulled up Software Heritage because I'm a big big fan of it. They have a page on here that I can't find immediately kind of showing all of the different projects that they index, but um, 
I, I cherish that too. So anyway, I'll, I'll stop sharing. If, if people later have questions about a particular country or metric, happy to, to share again. Yes, uh, thank you. Very, very promising. We did agree apparently that the best policy is to first publish and think later. But we also have to think and to understand. I, I observe that we are more and more living in a world of interdependent free and open source software. And there are dependencies and security issues. If we don't understand a bit the very structure of the soft ecosystem we are living in, we'll have to face important concerns. We can remember Log4G, for example. We can remember that we, we can observe that sometimes when we discover a security failure, because we don't know the story of the evolution of the code, the, the forks, etc., we, we are not able to correct everything because we don't have a, a proper vision of the, the history and the evolution of the codes. And probably that's a very important new frontier. We have to, to build new tools and new approaches to, to understand and to control this very complex system of soft. Do you agree? <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. Um, I think, you know, Sri Lanka, just to one example, it has a really vibrant open source community. So this kind of data, um, if they are using GitHub, Primarily, I mean, it could be really interesting to understand the evolution of that community as one thing. But just on the, you know, many countries um, are technology takers and product takers when it comes to e-government systems, so don't have the luxury of um, saying, you know, everything will be open. You know, they're buying software from big companies, uh, which will not certainly make the code open, right? Uh, not even APIs, it's a, a very close, tight, licensed system is what they're buying. And I think as countries go along that technology maturity road, like Sri Lanka at some point came to the point where there was enough capacity with the CTO, with the you know government agency who was able to say, okay, we will build some of this in-house, I will use the open source community um, who's working around the world to build some of these tools to set up the basic government architecture. But that takes a bit of time, I think, to get to this stage. Because the easiest thing is to get some donor money and to do a procurement of a closed system. And that's really problematic, yeah. Small, small comment, when I was in charge, the budget for buying software in France was four billion euros a year. Half of it was um, consumer products, like, uh, I don't know, Windows or... <laughs> so for this, of course, we cannot negotiate. But half of these two billion were a proper, yes, backend system. And here, you can decide by law that in the procurement, the soft has to be open. And uh, we are trying to, we, we try to do this, and now that's quite a, a standard for French procurement. I have many thoughts on that because I'm very curious. We've been talking a lot um, during IGF about digital public goods and how that could be discovered a little bit more. Um, but that is maybe a little bit off course. Um, but made me think a little bit about that. I think. Well, actually, don't. Oh. If if I could yeah. interrupt, I, it's it's actually not not off course in a way. Or at least maybe I can mm -hmm. I can tie it in. Yeah, I think please. the and maybe I'll uh, share my screen again. Really. Really quick. I mean, this might have been something we're planning to talk about later, but I think it's a good opportunity to actually. Um, so this that I'm sharing now is the Digital Public Goods Registry, which, in part, which has dig which ha digital public goods could be software, could be data, uh, could be AI models, could be a lot of different things. But it's mostly software. In fact, you can see the breakdown here uh, uh, between software, data, and content. And you can see that they're all tagged in relation to a particular SDG. Part of the, I mean, a big part of the motivation here is we're gonna find and share solutions, you know, to uh, uh, to progress on, on the various S SDGs. The same kind of concept can be useful to kind of just basically uh, curation of information about open projects is its own data project in a way, and can be very helpful in not reinventing the wheel, finding that you know a, uh, a government or 
civil society institution is our is already you know serving a particular need uh, in that software was developed in country A and people in country B can maybe take it and and use it or or customize it and so they have a little bit more I guess sovereignty or autonomy to use those words that um, are are quite are quite popular now. See, and, the, and the, the way it's really tied together, I think, is that the, yes, we're, these are tools that can be helpful for development, for um, SDG attainment, for sovereignty, but it's also a data project, kind of doing this kind of organization and, you know, which is its own, which is its own effort. Um, and I'll stop sharing now. No, oh, thank you, Mike. Um, I do also want to highlight the Open Terms Archive, which I believe is a digital public good uh, incubated with the government of France. Um, linking back to you mentioned on security, having ways to um, public record every version of a specific term, um, and I think it does tie in very well with security. And I was a little curious to go to the next slide about um, our topic on data privacy and consent, and then also widely on security. Um, I'd love to know some of your thoughts on how to really safeguard um, the all the data that impacts um, the users. How should public or private sector provide data that is secure and um, ensures privacy? It is a big question and there's no perfect answer, of course, but um, another way to think about it is, is um, if there's one suggestion for private sector data who would, that are thinking of um, releasing data sets, if they release a wide set, is there anything they should keep in mind before doing so? Yes, <clears throat> yes that's, that's a very complex question and there is no silver bullet. In Europe, we started with the principles. So, the GDPR, which started in France in uh, 1978, decided that regarding personal data, data speaking about you, the consent of the user is needed. <laughs> so it's, it's mandatory. So then we had to, we, we, you can conceive uh, legal approaches or technological approaches. And, and for example, I, I'm very interested by an Indian project, the Digital Empowerment and Privacy Architecture, that does organize technically a way to, to check the consent in a way that's try to be um, an infrastructure to, to unleash innovation. This is not a burden, this is an infrastructure for innovation. So you can implement it on various approaches and some are better than others, but there is a strong principle there. And for example, just to mention it, there is also a legal controversy between uh, France and Anglo-Saxon countries because we consider personal data as something like your body. You are not the owner of your body. You cannot decide anything regarding your body. And you cannot decide anything regarding your personal data. There are some fundamental rights. In uh, the world of the copyright, this is a, a different approach, and that's great. We can exchange. And, uh, but uh, in France, we are very... We have strong commitments that you, you, you cannot treat personal data as an average data. I think that this is the approach many countries are taking, seeing a difference between like sharing weather data, for example, and very different from personal data. I think we talked about it earlier as well. I think what the minister is talking about is sort of the policy legal, and then we talked about some of the technical solutions. And I think at a practical level, there's private data, but there's also commercially sensitive data. So our approach, for example, was to say we will not work with one telecom operator's data because that's highly commercially sensitive where um, the base stations are, which direction it's facing, you know, the power on those base stations, et cetera. 
we will say we said we'll go into this sort of kind of data and analytics to understand you know where people live where people move all of that is possible with mobile network data but we will only do it if we have more than one company contributing data and then we sort of anonymize at a company level like the base stations are not known whether it's company x or y so the more data that you pool it that brings another level of protection on commercially uh, sensitive data in our case yeah Yes, of course. Statistic uh, um, anonymization can be useful for some purposes. If you want to make epidemiology, for example, if you want to understand where people population goes in case of a natural disaster, if you want even to check if France or Germany did respect more the lockdown during the COVID, do you know that we did respect <laughs> the lockdown more than Germans? Yes. <laughs> we learned this through operators' data because, of course, Everyone, if, including me, yeah. would have bet that German would have been more, <laughs> more um, uh, strong. Uh, so you can have a very important use of statistic data, but except this approach, I think that you can never really anonymize a personal data, yeah. data describing one person. You can yeah. delay the name, the age. So at some point, someone will find you. So if you want to, to build knowledge regarding one person, <laughs> someone, here you need other approaches, like confidential computing, te technological solutions. You agree, agree. And I think sort of it depends on the situation and what the company is releasing data for, right? I think what we're saying is at aggregate level, there's a lot of use you can make out of it. You don't need, you know, anything that's even remotely identifiable. You can talk about groups of people. But I mean, COVID was a classic example. To understand movement, that was good enough. Facebook check-in data was being used, you know, in some governments to see where people are. But at some point, if you're looking at an outbreak and then you're trying to contact trace using data, then that's a very different level of privacy violation and you need the legal backing to say, okay, this is a national emergency and I'm now going to actually identify who owns that cell phone because we need to know where that person may have spread, uh, you know, moved and then spread the virus. So it depends on the question you're asking, really, what, what company data can do and what the safeguards should be. Thank you. I also want to make sure, give an opportunity, Mike, if you have any thoughts on safeguards and privacy and consent on private sector data being released? I think really all of the key points have been covered already. Um, so I don't think I really have anything substantive to, I mean, directly on point to that, but maybe I'll just relate it to another um, thing that's happening now uh, that's kind of related to open data and open code which is a debate around how open, quote, open source AI has to be. And a lot of, and the reason why there's a link is because a lot of times data can't be fully opened uh, be for privacy and, and, and other reasons. And yet society can still benefit from having some of the outputs of that training, uh, often called the, the, the model. Um, and so there's kind of a debate about um, what kinds of sharing of data that's being used to train an open AI model makes it open or not. To some extent, this is a very academic debate, but at the same time, it could end up being, um, you know, reflected in law as, you know, because it's often recognized that that open source might need special treatment because of its non-proprietary nature, but, you know, it can be, there are kind of a bunch of different ways that you can, for a data corpus that's used to train an AI model, the raw data is extremely useful, obviously, but there are other things that can be useful at all. That can be useful as well. For example, a, uh, you know, a description of the schema of all the data that you're using so that other people can bring their own data and replicate the model. Um, if like two parties have access to similar private data sets, then then they can be close substitutes for for each other. So I think that's a like a burgeoning area that all of these issues kind of come back together around.
sorry. My, this is not just an academic issue, the question of uh, which data you did use to train the model. Uh, first, you are in California, I feel. Um, I have read that the, one of the important reasons of the screenwriter's strike was generative AI, because they wanted to be sure that the work will be respected. So it can have very concrete and important impact. And if we don't pay attention to this, first we will delay all the international architecture of intellectual property, then we'll create new disbalance and inequalities, because some big companies will take the profit of every creation of, of, every, of all humankind because they will take everything, everything we did dream, write, learn, publish, share, and they will use it to train some big monopolistic models. So from my perspective, this is not just an academic controversy, this is one of the most important topics of, of those days. And we have to be sure, and, and we can also think about security issues, security concerns. So the traceability, if I may, of the, how was this model educated is a very, very important issue. And we, uh, we don't have proper answers today. Because you can yeah, go... I, 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 I agree with you. Just, just to clarify the, the academic comment, I was exactly... What do you, what can you call open or not? Is this thing that's somewhat academic, but the fundamental issues are of extreme importance. And I, and I really appreciate the, you know, French government's direction around, around open source AI. It is extremely important. No, I mean, <laughs> just to say there's like a million conversations about training data and the problems of using certain data for training. I don't think this is the forum for it. Uh, women, people of color, developing country people are at the receiving end of decisions made by models made uh, that were trained on data that does not talk about them. So, that you, you know, that's a whole other field. So I don't think we need to talk about it. Just to say that, completely agree. The issues around training data are very real and huge. Another important concern is a definition of definition of privacy itself, because ten years ago, to protect my privacy, I just had to protect my personal data, and I was protected. Today, I can know a lot about you without knowing anything about you. <laughs> because I, I will educate a model and it will predict something about you. Right. So I cannot protect myself just while protecting my personal data. And, and not living in the digital world is no longer a safeguard against not being profiled. You can profile me even if I have no email address, no presence online, so yeah. Mm. Yes, definitely on. Oh. <laughs> On privacy, I think being able to layer in different data sets and as a, result, as a result, you have a profile of a person. I think it is fascinating to be able to see different data sets. I think um, as I'm looking at the time now, I want to move on to our last point on promoting and supporting open code initiatives, um, considering all of the topics we talked about with security, safeguards, um, privacy. What is the best way to really promote open code initiatives and how can member states do so? So first, there are more and more uh, approaches, and that's great. So you have a strong um, European policy, for example. You have a network of uh, open source officers in European governments. You have, uh, I did mention the French law. It was named uh, La Loi pour une République numérique. So law for a digital republic that imposed to the government to publish everything on open source and fully reusable. Um, <coughs> we are promoting, this is a European Foundation for Digital Commons, because we want Europe to take is its responsibility and to contribute to finance commons that are important for, for freedom and sovereignty and self-determination. So we, we, there are a lot of initiatives, but the more, I, the more I work on this field, um, the more I observe that financing is not enough and maybe it's not the most important part. Um, really using free software, uh, open source, 
contributing, allowing your public servant to contribute, paying attention. For example, when we did prepare the DSA, we did quite kill Wikipedia because we said companies with more than, I don't remember, uh, 400,000 uh, 400, connections a month in more than seven European countries has to be a legal representative in every European state. For a big tech company, that's not very expensive. But for Wikipedia, <laughs> that's very expensive. So we need a, a conviviality, we need a proximity, we need a, a constant interaction, we need a mutual understanding. And this is maybe the, the most difficult today. Um, I want to add just two things to this which is, I think, one is capacity. Uh, public sector has very low technical capacity in many of the majority world countries in the, you know, in the developing world. And uh, the expectation of, except for a handful of public sector officials, anyone else being able to contribute code, I mean, it's a dream for many countries, right? So maybe what they, what we need are, and that's great if you can do that, and that's kind of the aspirational stage you want to be. So instead of that, another solution is to build the communities, because the private sector is a lot more evolved and highly skilled, right? Uh, so, so it's like, I keep going back to Sri Lanka, but you know, the, the really vibrant open source community, highest number of contributions to Apache, for example, right? So they, that comes from Sri Lanka, that comes from, you know, being in high paid, export-oriented software companies, but a couple of people really getting this community together to create this. So how can they participate in government-related stuff? I think that needs two things. One is that community building, but they, they can't participate in government procurement. That's really hard. Government procurement is a system that puts out a bid and gives points to a company that has done this 10 times before in five reference countries, right? A group of people who come together who don't have that references. It's very hard to signal that they can do this. That the, so I think there's some problem there. Then at a practical level, I think if you want to maybe, you know, not go all out, but at least give some preference for open source, um, some governments, what they do is, you know, act out of 100, allocate five to 10 extra points, which you get as a bonus if you are proposing an open system. And there's variations on open, completely open code, you know, free and open, you know, open, you know, open AIs, et cetera. So, you know, a graded set of systems uh, marks in the procurement. So different types of companies can at least have a hope of participating and competing against the large firms. This is kind of the same strategy that company governments um, in the South have used to promote local companies when it comes to government procurement of IT systems. It's very hard to compete with, you know, I mean, I, for example, purchased on when I was in government, pension systems, right? A big company will come and say, I've done pension systems in five of these company, five countries. It's very hard for a local company. So then we say, well, if you at least have a local partner in the first year for technical support, in the second year for actual deployment, you get five marks. So the same way, you can build up this sort of legacy of open source by allocating marks over time in procurement systems. I totally take the point. And, um that's interesting because if you do observe the story of governments, they had technical skills to build bridges, roads, uh, railways, um, <clears throat> and there is something different in the history of IT. Maybe because the history <coughs> started in the military era, as you know, with a project to, to launch rockets from a submarine, and uh, it was from the beginning, very big procurement, <laughs> very expensive, with very bizarre uh, rules of conducting projects. That are, and governments should learn to work with ecosystems, as you say, to be maybe a bit more humble, to learn about uh, agile's methodology, to, to, to agree to start with an imperfect project and to improve it, to have a constant improvement policy. So this is a cultural change. And just to finish, maybe it will be time to conclude. That's why, from my perspective, there is a strong connection between open source movements, open government movements, because you need to, to learn uh, humility, to, to be an actor between a net within a network of actors, 
and a state modernization, and maybe the new democracy that we need with collective intelligence, citizen engagement, uh, participation, contribution, etc. You cannot work just on one of the three topics. You need to, to cross the three, the three topics. Perfect, thank you. And I think um, looking at the time, we are almost at time, but before we go to q and A, I I want to make sure, um, Mike, if there you have any thoughts as well on uh, this topic of promoting and supporting open code initiatives. Uh, sure, I've, I have first, I mean, every everything I already said has been great and I have too many thoughts, but I'll just uh, say one thing, you know, I, I think what doesn't get, what, what, does it, what doesn't get measured doesn't get paid attention to. It's, it's fantastic that we have, free and open source software advocates within government now, but a much broader set of policymakers need to appreciate the role that open source plays in the economy and development, et cetera. And that's kind of one of the motivations of the innovation graph that we that we you know launch that we want to if if you want to see numbers that are kind of tuned to your jurisdiction, then you can you can look at those even um you know, even if you don't uh, have a fundamental appreciation of um, of open source and understand that it's a really big uh, driver of jobs, economic growth. People have used GitHub data um, to show that, you know, more, in, including policies that support, that foster open source leads to more startup formation, more jobs and things like this. Um, there's a really important study uh, from the, uh, or commissioned by the European Commission, I guess, uh, several years ago, kind of putting a floor on the the contribution of open source to the EU economy um, of, I believe the range was like 65 to 95 billion euro a year. So quite significant and would love to see that replicated in, um, you know, in other jurisdictions in a way that's very legible to policymakers who don't know anything about uh, don't have any affinity for open source, don't know anything about technology necessarily. I, so I think those uh, making it legible is, is super important. Thank you, Mike. And I think um, before I, before we move to our Q&A, um, particular open source in the social sector, there's um, a lot of um, organizations that work in the social sector that are also open source. We mentioned digital public goods, and there's also research in India, Kenya, and Mexico, taking a look at what were the drivers um, for social sector um, open source organizations. How are they uh, funded? What are their initiatives as well that I think um, in another section we can explore more on open source in uh, the social sector. Okay, and I believe also Malakumar was um, instrumental in leading that research. Uh, as we move to our Q&A section here, um, open the floor up to anybody who has any questions here in person, please. Hi, good morning everyone. My name is Sumana Shrestha. I'm a parliamentarian from Nepal. And I was very curious to attend this because I have a lot of questions. Um, so the first one is how do you incentivize these entities to actually share data? Uh, when you think about different segment, sec actors that exist to improve the society, you've got private sector obviously, you've got government, and you've got a very influential um, INGOs and UN that work. Um, so how, what are some of the ideas, what has worked um, maybe in Sri Lanka or other parts of the world to incentivize these different actors to actually share data in whatever format, right? Whatever privacy setting format. Um, the reason I ask that is one of the things in my previous life before parliamentarian, uh, what I've seen is there is a massive incentive to hoard the data and then come up with insights to then present and say, okay, I have some advantage over everybody else uh, that then sort of uh, warrants funding for me to go out and do something. It could be uh, going and distributing relief material when there are earthquake or disasters, for example, right? That's one. And then it'll be really great to understand a bit more on this French procurement 
um, law that you mentioned that you require a certain percentage to be open source. Um, how did you, in Nepal, we have a very big distrust, mistrust towards anything that's open. They think anything that's free is not good quality, etc. Um, so we tend to procure, and you're smiling, <laughs> maybe because you, <laughs> you, we see the same problem. That's exactly the contrary. Well, if so you have a closed system, you don't know if there are backdoors. Right. So, so I think maybe it also, I understand. But how did you go about building that level of trust um, in open sources? Uh, if you've seen, if, if there was something fundamental you did, I think it also maybe pertains to the capacity, right? How many people can act, do actually have the capacity in Nepal to go check the open source code and then see if there are backdoors? So what are some of the inbuilt assumptions that you have? Um, and what are the maybe very focused uh, attention that you paid to strengthen those pillars to then build, bring this level of trust in open source? Um, I think let's, let's start with that. Okay. I mean, I'll go on the data part, I think. Uh, <laughs> the, sort of the, you know, superficial answer is it's actually very difficult to get the incentives right for data sharing, right? Uh, data is power, and therefore the incentives are to hoard it, whether you use it or not, actually. That's the interesting part. So we've spent the past year looking at public-private data partnerships across Africa, Asia, Latin America, Middle East, and the Caribbean, and mapped like over 900 different partnerships uh, around data, and done some in-depth case studies. And we see a couple of things. One is it, um, that data sharing is a really high transaction cost activity, right? Uh, because you know capacities are different. You you know particularly if you're dealing with a large company and trying to get some data, you don't even know who to reach because there are regional managers, marketing managers, somebody in San Francisco, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? Uh, so it's high transaction cost, and what that does is it privileges the really large companies because they can come negotiate with the government, uh, spend the money, and they can also enter a market and subsidize something with data with a very long-term view. So, I mean, Microsoft, for example, is a case in point where they can go and do something in a country that's in the early stages of development, digitization, because in 10 years, when everyone gets a computer, you know that operating system is more likely to be a Microsoft one. So they can make those kinds of investments for the long term in data partnerships, right? Many small ones don't. So partnership building, this is why I said the easy answer is it's difficult, because partnership building around data are really difficult. Um, so the incentives have to be set up. So we talk often about this incentive of, you know, you can get data from Uber, if it is in Nepal, but I'll talk about Sri Lanka, uh, that has some percentage market share. Uber can give it to government or civil society to understand, you know, where people are or something. But actually, if you now combine with two other local taxi companies and share the data back with Uber and everybody, in a non-commercially sensitive way, it's now suddenly much more useful to Uber, it's useful to the local person, it's useful to the transport planning person in government as well. So you kind of find the incentive system that makes it worthwhile for the large and the small operators to, operators to come and play. And then you set up the technical infrastructure for data sharing, of course, right? And you give them the kind of confidence that says, we are not going to share sensitive data you know, like in the telecom example I gave. You also then put the legislation around it for telecom data in particular. We really had to sort of make sure that the telecom regulators didn't have a problem. So you need sort of research exceptions or public policy or journalistic exceptions in data sharing, particularly if it comes to uh, sensitive data. So, I mean, bridging those transaction costs and getting the incentives right, I can sort of, those are the broad principles, but really finding the incentives are a case by case basis. So, we find the successful ones are often where like a middle broker is involved in getting these data partnerships going, right? Somebody who can convene multiple people. So, a classic example would be um, in India, UN. Uh, 
UN had a now defunct, but a pulse lap Jakarta, the UN data governance system, sort of, you know, uh, they would sort of sit in the middle and convince government that they need to play in this data game, that they need to use private sector data. They develop that capacity because government doesn't automatically say, I'll use private sector data, right? And sometimes governments can't say that either because private, you know, like the census department often has a rule that thou shalt conduct national surveys, not use call detail records for population projection, right? So they don't give up. So work with government. Then bring like five different private sector players to together. Uh, sometimes it involves paying for the data, sometimes it's setting up the incentive systems. The Global Partnership for Sustainable Development data in Africa brought together the group on um, Earth observations, which allowed satellite data about Africa, like as a block, and to any country who wanted it, they made it available. So data brokerage also plays a role. I'm not saying government can't be a data broker, but a, that role of a data broker is really important because otherwise what you, happen, what you have is one-off data transactions, right? I mean, during COVID, everyone managed to get you know, some Facebook data to understand where people were. That's not really useful because now COVID is over, none of those data is flowing anymore to government or to civil society. So to set, up, set it up in a sustainable way that you can understand development and use that data requires a bit more. Thank you for your very precise and uh, important questions. First, as you said, um, most people of power has quite an instinct of hiding the data. But this is uh, the old approach. <laughs> First, this is not, obviously this is not the best um, global organization, as you can easily see in the bureaucracy, for example. <laughs> when I did join the French government 10 years ago to lead the open data policy, sometimes uh, four different administrations did build the same data with mistakes. And they did spend a lot of time and money to sell data between administrations of the same government. So it was unuseful, expensive, long. I discovered, uh, because it was expensive, sometimes some, administra some administration did use very old data sets because they did buy it just every four years, for example, uh, to the neighbor and with the same money because it, we are one state. <laughs> so this is not a, the best uh, global organization and maybe this is not the best strategy. What I've learned from the digital economy story is that platform strategies are better. If you have data, you share this, and you become the center of the ecosystem, and you have more influence, maybe less direct power, but much more soft power. And the story of, I don't know, uh, my, Microsoft, Google, uh, Amazon, is a story of people sharing their data, not of people hiding their data. So first, yes, this is a natural instinct, but we have to fight it because this is a stupid strategy to hide your data. Then, regarding the controversies uh, regarding open source, yes, in France, we usually consider that open source is the best security approach because you can check, you can, uh, you, you can contribute, so if you discover something, you can fix it. Uh, that's funny because, for example, if you observe the story of European countries, uh, now everything is uh, converging, but 20 years ago, the French public sector did use a lot of uh, open source and free software, and not the private sector. And in Germany, it was the contrary. The German companies did use a lot of free software and not the German government. So you have also national histories, of course. It depends on your... But in France, probably, it's also political. Uh, most public decision makers consider that open source is less expensive. And if it's not, because sometimes it, it has cost, of course. But you will spend your money to pay uh, national workers, not benefits <laughs> in Seattle. So that's a better use of your public money, <laughs> because you create value in your country. And usually, it's less expensive. A better security and maybe a better democracy. You know, in the Declaration of Human Rights, in 1789, we say that the government has to be accountable, that every citizen has a right to understand what the government is doing and to check if this is the most efficient approach. So now, most of the governmental actions are made through big and complex uh, systems. If you don't have the, the right to understand the, the black box, 
you are not a perfect democracy. <laughs> And you have to rely on someone that pretends to make the best, but you don't know. So the mix of cost, security, and democracy makes that in France this is not a controversy anymore. Most people um, in the public sector encourage this approach. If you need a strategy, you did ask for... The first uh, easy step is about public procurement. I'm not speaking about buying software. I'm speaking about buying services. I remember 10 years ago, the city of Paris wanted a, a network of self-driving cars. But they did right in the procurement. And I will access to every data, and I will share it in open data. And the companies didn't want to, but they said, that's my market, my procurement. If you don't accept, I will take another <laughs> solution. So for water, for transport, for when you buy a service or you delegate a public service, just think about writing one clause saying, and I will take the data and I will share the data. That's not so difficult if you have a, a competitive market. Um, the second thing, of course, is to explain, to exchange, to build an ecosystem and... Uh, Yes, to be frank, I don't think that those strategies can be done if you don't have any ecosystem. It can be an ecosystem of uh, open source software, it can be an ecosystem of startup, or a big tech company, it, I don't care. But you need to work with private the civil society or private sector. You need to work with outside of the government. If you, if you cannot rely on some skills and competencies and energy and innovation and creativity, that's very difficult. And regarding the, the la loi pour une république numérique, so to be precise, we wrote that every software that the government develops or we pay for development has to be open source. It was built on the premises of the law for free access to information. During the 70s, we decided, so we wrote that uh, the citizen has the right to ask for every information regarding government action. So how did you pay, uh, wh where the, the, did the money go, and we, we did build uh, on these premises. So of course when we buy, uh, as I said, a consumer product, we don't ask for open source, but when we finance the development of the product, or when we develop ourselves, um, this is mandatory. Regarding the competencies, as you said, uh, this is all very often a problem. But you, you know, you don't really need a very, very, very s skilled people because we are speaking about a simple IT. <laughs> and sometimes, for example, just a funny story. Um, Ten years ago, I did create also the, the job of a chief data officer for the French government. And I did hire a great data scientist to fix and to, to build good public policies. <laughs> and I did hire brilliant people, and we did help maybe 100 administrations to improve some public policies. And after four years, they went to me and they told me, this job is a bit boring. We did just use Excel <laughs> software and linear regression. Because government has very pro structured data and very simple questions. You don't need to make a generative AI on a big data with a big... Da you don't need this to fix 80% of the problems. If you have simple people with simple software, but very focused to, to have an impact. And very often we did build for example, in France, the French ID system, France Connect, which is used now by 40 million people every week. We are a small country regarding to India. So, so 40 million people is something in France. I did build it with six developers in six months. The global price was 600,000 euros. Of course, if uh, I had decided to, to buy it to some big companies that you can imagine, it would have cost, I don't know, uh, 30 million euros. <laughs> so, but when you do it yourself with simple principles, with this agile methodology I did mention, so make a first minimum viable product and then improve it, that's not so expensive and you don't need uh, 
Nobel Prize, if I may. <laughs> you just need good and serious developers. And um, maybe one last thing. When we did, I was there, uh, when we did decide this law regarding the... So some people had concerns. So we decided to mention a cybersecurity exception. So if the cybersecurity agency say that publishing the code is dangerous, we won't. It was five years ago, it did never happen. They did never find a software publishing the code was dangerous. <laughs> so it was a security to make people comfortable and it was never useful. <laughs> Uh, let me just make a quick thing. I think this is quite amazing. Um, just one little challenge, depending on the structure of your civil service, is to attract people with skill to do this kind of development. You need to look at what other options you have, and particularly in South Asia, they can work for a global IT firm, usually for five to ten times the government salary, and that's a real incentive problem. So the way some countries deal with it is to have these other structures like a government-owned private company that does a lot of this IT development who don't have to abide by government pay scales and that then suddenly makes it attractive. Somebody who wants to do civic tech, public technology, but also isn't compromising and sort of you know, making low government salary. If I can say something because that's very important. So most of the people that went to work with me did divide their salary by two. But you can have very skilled and dedicated people if you give them a mission and autonomy. But if you ask them to divide their salary and to obey to ten, uh, a big hierarchy chain and to respect a stupid and a very complex framework, and so you have to give them an, a mission, a real mission. Let's fight unemployment. Let's let's educate. Let's and a kind of autonomy. And that's why we have to change the way we, we do organize bureaucracy. <laughs> so, but that's not impossible. And actually, a lot of countries did it. Uh, and more and more, I feel. And always with people coming from the private sector. Private or the big, important uh, open source ecosystem. It can be also Wikipedia, uh, GitHub, uh, OpenStreetMap. In France, we work a lot with the OpenStreetMap community. So uh, Linux, uh, Debian, enfin, it's not always private firms. It can be, the, but that's the outside of the government. Thank you. And taking a look on our virtual attendees, we have some questions on whether um, there are government tools regarding securing data. Um, oh, let's double check and potentially um, I think let's start with that first. Um, if there's any thoughts on that. If not, we do have another question as well. Let's take a look I, I have sort yes. of, I have a, a small comment on that that might not be directly addressing it, but I just want to highlight how important cyber, basically cybersecurity is for protecting data. There's, um, if you have a breach due to an exploit, then your data is exposed no matter what other measures you have taken. And I wanna kind of tie that back into the previous discussion. I think um, the sort of the idea that open source is more secure because everybody can audit it and see, see exploits and fix them is sort of true, but also a little bit of a double-edged sword and can actually be useful in Paul is very pertinent in policy conversations now because um, one analogy is that open source is free, but it's also like a free puppy that you have to take care of. And uh, due to incidents like Log4j, I think the attention of policymakers has been focused that open source is part of our societal infrastructure and it's something that we can't only rely on the developers of individual projects to um, adequately to adequately secure. So there needs to be kind of investment from a bunch of stakeholders, including governments, in making sure that that ability to for everybody to review the code and make fixes is actually acted on. And uh, 
Germany is really a leader in this uh, with the sovereign tech funds, but there are others in the US the Open Technology Fund and kind of others brewing. But I think that's a really um, important point that that potential for open source need, uh, being more secure actually needs to be actioned and needs coordinated, coordinated action. And I think in sort of another way that this kind of loops back on itself is that those decisions about where to invest what open source code is actually you know, critical um, you know, for power plants, for elections or whatever, you actually need data to be able to identify where you make those investments. Otherwise you're, you're boiling the ocean. So um, it's fairly tangential, but it just basic cybersecurity is just absolutely crucial for protecting data. You're completely right, open source creates a possibility to check, but someone has to do it. <laughs> oh, I have another funny experience. In France, we had an um, interesting uh, free bureautic suit, you know, so Word, Excel, uh, it was named Framasoft. And during the COVID, the Ministry of Education decided uh, and did said publicly, I will use Framasoft. And the people from Framasoft uh, did yell and contest this, and they say, but are you crazy? Are you really considering to put uh, one million teacher and uh, 10 million students on my infrastructure without giving me anything? But I will die. <laughs> you have to finance infrastructure, uh, servers, uh, or you will kill me. And uh, that was funny because it could have been seen as a big victory that the ministry, the French Ministry of Education, one of the biggest international administration <laughs> bigger than the Red Army. So it could have been seen as a victory, but it was uh, the kiss of death. And uh, so we have to be serious and to nurture and protect and finance this ecosystem, or we will kill it. This is not a, there is no such thing as a free software, <laughs> free lunch. We have to, someone has to pay a bit. <laughs> Thank you. I know we are at time, but I want to double check to see if anybody has any questions in the audience here or online. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for attending. Any concluding thoughts from our speakers here? No, not a problem. And well, thank you so much for everybody to attending this very early morning in Japan session. And we look forward to any other thoughts that you have on open code on development. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.